Good afternoon, everyone. I am Babu Jackson, the Chief Technology Officer at the BPC. I'm excited to have you all join us today as we focus on charting a course for virtual, augmented, and mixed reality. As these technologies move from science fiction to reality, we need to think about the plan and plan for the potentiality of the technology. For this undertaking, BPC partnered with the XRA Association. We held four convenings with experts from industry, civic associations, and government. This is the third of three public events, and we've also engaged with many stakeholders to gather a deeper understanding of where we are currently and where we can and what we can do going forward to ensure the best outcomes from the user of XR, from the use of XR technology. Today, BPC released a report titled Thinking Ahead About XR, summarizing BPC's findings from this effort that you can find on our website. Given the keynote address today will be Chike Agu. Chike is joining us today in his personal capacity. Chike is someone who has been thinking very hard about the topic of XR. He is a 2020 Harvard Tech and Human Rights Fellow. He is also the Chief Innovation Officer of the Department of Labor. I'll now turn it over to Chike. I really want to thank the XR Association and the Bipartisan Policy Center for having me today, and more importantly, for really putting their heads and the heads of so many brilliant stakeholders across so many fields to work on this important question of how we get the most out of XR in a way that's effective, equitable, and efficient. Um, for me, when I think about these types of questions, uh, I try not to think about the ones and the zeros and, and the technology, but I in some ways try and root it in um, the needs of average workers, average Americans, uh, average people. And so for me, I always think about my own personal story. My parents are from a small out of the way village in Nigeria that most Nigerians themselves will never go to and never visit. And none of my grandparents went past middle school. My parents had Peace Corps volunteers in their classrooms. And in the late seventies and early eighties, my parents got golden tickets to come and study and work here in the United States of America. And in many ways, without American opportunity and American education, I, I wouldn't be here. So one of the questions I think about when I think about emerging technologies like XR is I think about uh, what are the things that one would need to do today in America to enable my parents to do now what they did then, to go from in one generation, no one going past middle school to me sitting here uh, as an appointee of an American president. And the answer is handling emerging technologies like XR in the, in the most efficient, effective and equitable ways possible. When we think about the promise of XR, we think about new ways of reskilling. As we think about COVID, we think about companies who are mailing out headsets to train folks to be claims adjusters, to do customer service without ever leaving their homes. When we think about, uh, in my day job at the Department of Labor, uh, the ways that XR is being used to help workers with disabilities who, may, who, who potentially are homebound or who potentially need XR because of particular uh, uh, ne uh, neurological needs. XR has a huge potential and advantage to, at scale, help many more workers be the most themselves in today's economy. What is also clear is that for any emerging technology, whether it be XR, whether it be artificial intelligence, whether it be uh, autonomous vehicles, if we don't put equity at the front of our analysis and equity at the front, at the front of our efforts, we will potentially uh, not scale opportunity, but we will scale inequity. We will scale bias. And, and that's something that we cannot do. And so we have to be uh, properly bold, but also properly cautious in how we implement XR and, and scale the, uh, these technologies. There are examples in this amazing re report that's been written here that every sector, whether it be the private sector, the public sector, the nonprofit space, uh, need to look at to answer both of those questions. And some of the things that we know are really, really clear uh, in, her, in terms of how, of, how, of how we get the most are so, some of the following principles. One, there's a phrase uh, said by a colleague of mine, which I always repeat, which is uh, nothing for us without us. Meaning the people who are meant to get the most of these technologies, the workers who are most disadvantaged, people of color, people with disabilities, women, immigrants, as well as people from the rural parts of our country, from low incomes, they have to be involved in the testing of these technologies. If we do not have them at the table, these technologies will not achieve their economic promise, and they will not achieve their moral promise in, in this country. Secondly, and this is really a question to all the amazing entrepreneurs and startups and companies who are using XR now, when you look at your teams who are developing these technologies, do they represent America? To use the, the phrase of uh, some people that I work for, 
does your workforce look like America? And if it does not look like America, it is likely that you will not have your technologies to make the most impact on America that you want. The last piece, and a really important piece, is how are we getting these technologies to as many people as possible? And as someone who used to work in the private sector, we used to talk a lot about distribution, the last mile. How do we make sure that from the lab to the front line, that we are getting these technologies to the workers who need them most? And this, is a, this has to be intentional. It's not something that will take care of itself. And so that, that is a challenge and a charge and an opportunity for everyone developing these technologies to make the most of them, not just for their own bottom line, but also for the benefit of this country. Because done well, XR can, 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 can be a technological bridge to opportunity. Done wrong, it can scale a lot of the biases that we need to undo today. So I really thank the Bipartisan Policy Center. I really thank uh, the XR Association for having me today, for putting their heads together on this report. And I challenge all of us to read what's in here, apply it to our, to our own circumstance. And I challenge all of us to make sure that we are being equally bold and equally equitable in how we scale this technology for the benefit of us all. Thank you so much. And I, and I really congratulate these organizations on this, on this amazing uh, summit and the rest of their day. Thank you. And we thank, thank you to Chike um, Agu for that great keynote. And for the viewers, we will be taking questions using the live chat function on YouTube and also via Twitter by the hashtag BPC Live. Joining us today in this discussion, we have a excellent panel. I'm very excited about it. Uh, on our panel, we have Elizabeth Hyman, the Chief Executive Officer of the XRA Association. We also have Jessica Outlaw, the founder of The Extended Mind, Jeremy Nelson, who is the director of the XR Initiative at the University of Michigan, and also John Sarushian, the associate director of business and technology here at the BPC. So thank you all for joining in. We'll get right into the panel and we'll jump right in with the uh, first question. We'll jump in at a very high level and i like to kick it off to everyone. Before we start talking about the report and the XR initiative, can you tell us how you became interested in immersive technologies and what you would say to someone new to this topic about why they should care? And we can start with you, Liz. Great, thanks Babu, and thank you Bipartisan Policy Center. It's been a pleasure working with you guys on this project. Um, about five or six years ago, I had the opportunity to try on a headset um, and it was for a training simulation uh, for a first responder. And it was amazing to me that you could put somebody into a lifelike scenario and give them real options in terms of how they needed to respond to the, the action on the ground. And right at that moment, I was like, wow, this is terrific. It has a really big impact, I think, in terms of, you know, a first, in this instance, a first responder and how they were going to go about doing their job. And so I guess what I would say is at this point in time, we have a lot of conversation going on and it's exciting about the metaverse and what shared immersive experiences look like. Uh, but what this is all about is a big potential for a new computing platform that can really you know, enhance people's lives, uh, make workplaces safer, make our shared experiences more vivid, uh, could help doctors in some of the work that they're doing. I mean, there's some amazing, amazing applications. And so as we start this journey to get to, uh, you know, broad adoption of the technology, this is the new computing platform. And that's what I hope we get across today um, as we go into this conversation, so. Okay, same question. I'd like to turn it to Jessica. What got you interested in the, in immersive technologies? And what would you say to someone about why they should care? Mm, great question. Yeah, I want to just thank BPC and XRA for having me today. Um, because yeah, this is a topic I feel really passionately about. Um, in terms of my background, I trained as a behavioral scientist. I've always been really curious on how people decide, what informs decision, what changes learning. And there's this way in which, you know, like the BPC report includes all of these use cases about education or healthcare, but I'd rather tell a story about um, the history of cholera, because uh, I think that there's actually a story about cholera that explains why people should care about immersive technologies. And in the 1850s, people weren't actually sure that cholera was waterborne. 
until one person in London named Jon Snow drew out a map and showed that a cholera outbreak was directly linked to one specific well, um, where one, one specific water source in London. And because of that, the city shut down the, the water source and then the cholera outbreak ended and people's lives were saved. And the reason that I, I draw on this story is because like there's ways in which visualizing new information or visualizing information in new ways led to new insights and the potential ways for VR, AR, like 3D spatial technology to help us, you know, step inside of data, I think has vast potential that we haven't even begun to unlock. Thank you, thank you. So turn it to you next, Jeremy. Uh, what got you interested? Thank you. Yeah, it's, I'm excited to be here. Um, you know, my background is I'm a technologist. And so I've, you know, for over my career, I've really loved that intersection of emerging technologies and making big organizational change. And so there was an opportunity that arose to lead an XR initiative at the University of Michigan, uh, where we were tasked with bringing these technologies for teaching and learning uh, to the entire institution. And so there's just so many ways uh, that these technologies can support how students learn, uh, practicing certain skills and scenarios, and teaching uh, students how to build these experiences. Uh, we have an experience on campus that, that was built for a film, TV, and media course where students can reimagine the last scene of the film Citizen Kane. And so they can go into VR, and there was a whole motion captured scene of the last uh, last part of the movie, and they can move the camera around and refilm that scene. So it's just a new way for students to kind of understand materials, create content, uh, and, and become, you know, creators in this new space. And so that was just one example. There's so many more examples with architecture and nursing and medicine, uh, exploring spaces that maybe people can't go to. And, and so it's just been really exciting to see what faculty and students uh, come up with and how do we make that happen. Thank you. Thank you. Sounds very interesting. Uh, John? Thanks, Raghu. Uh, so BPC sort of entered the tech space several years ago, uh, and we actually first focused on artificial intelligence as a technology. Uh, and looking into artificial intelligence, uh, we were sort of tasked to host a series of convening events with civil society, industry, and elsewhere uh, to put together a series of reports uh, to help guide national strategy on AI for uh, the Congress. Uh, while we were doing this pro process, uh, we got reached out to by the XR Association saying, hey, you guys are doing a great job. You guys have gotten the different uh, stakeholders together and tried to see you know, where there's areas of agreement and disagreement. Uh, how about you, know, you, you try to work with us to do something similar in the XR space? Uh, I did not know that much about XR at that point, uh, beyond some of the stuff you might see on media related to gaming and entertainment. Uh, so I started digging in a bit, and I'm like, oh, th this is not just gaming and entertainment. There are a lot of uh, use cases that uh, people aren't talking about. And I started reading about you know, the uses of uh, virtual reality to train surgeons or augmented reality for the purposes of testing furniture uh, from a retailer in your own house. Uh, and all these various applications, which I don't think had caught the uh, public imagination uh, yet, and maybe still have not, and we're hoping to sort of, uh, you know, uh, promote and express. Uh, and while thinking through all these use cases, I started thinking of all the uh, policy questions that arise uh, with these different use cases, whether it's privacy or workforce training. And I thought this would be a cool area for uh, BPC to get into, uh, and sort of that's that's how I got uh, excited about uh, immersive technologies. Thank you, thank you. Um, so I guess we'll stay stay on that track there. And John, could you tell us a bit about the uh, BPC report? What's in it, and what are some of the takeaways? Of course. Uh, so uh, we. Uh, did this year-long effort where we hosted a series of convenings and public events, as I think was uh, referred to earlier. Uh, and we summarized a lot of our findings in this uh, report uh, that you can find uh, online, thinking ahead about XR. It should be on our website. Uh, and this report is really divided into six uh, broad sections, which I can list right now. Uh, we have a 
introductory section of the report, sort of uh, giving a real life, not a real life, a fictional story that could have occurred in real life uh, to try to motivate some of the policy issues that arise uh, in the context of uh, using immersive technology in manufacturing, uh, then broadening sort of why we're doing this effort and uh, what, what we hope to accomplish. That's our first section of the report. Uh, section, second section of the report explains what the technologies exactly are, what's VR, what's AR, what's MR. Uh, third section is why should people care, where it shows how sort of the sector has grown and it's been used in a variety of domains. Uh, fourth section is the different policy issues, and that's uh, the meat of the report is some of these policy issues, and we can go through that uh, in a bit. Uh, fifth section of the report is a path forward, uh, looking at uh, both existing policies, uh, gaps that, that might exist, uh, technical standards, and some of the debates that uh, we expect to come about in coming years on how to address uh, some of the challenges. And we conclude with a conclusion section. That's our uh, sixth section. But again, the meat of the report is the uh, policy section where we talk about different issues. As with any effort on a new technology, it's hard to get every possible issue that's out there. Uh, so we tried to compile at least six that we thought were very important, um, one being privacy, two security, three economic issues, four access and adoption, five equity and inclusion, six safety. Again, this is not all encompassing, but it was a way to try to bring uh, some of the issues to the forefront and try to show where the debate was as we saw it in the convening events. Uh, high level takeaways that we got from this effort, I'll just name a few. Uh, one, and again, this is in the report, you can see that XR has been expanding uh, and it's being used in a variety of domains, including healthcare, workforce training and education. Uh, XR raises many important policy issues. It's another takeaway, which some that we, we've listed already uh, and people need to research them more and uh, you know try to or continue to try to address uh, some of these issues. Three, and this is a point that our uh, keynote speaker, uh, Chika Gu, brought up, uh, we think it's very important for a diversity of uh, backgrounds and viewpoints to be included when designing uh, XR tools, policies, and standards. We think that's uh, important to make sure you know, people's different uh, concerns and uh, viewpoints are heard, understood when, again, designing uh, the tools, policies, and standards that are out there. Uh, Another takeaway was that we think existing policies and standards should be reviewed uh, to understand how they might apply to XR, uh, find any gaps in areas in need of modification. So we think uh, a review of existing policies is important uh, to see whether you know, we need to build off them, change them, or do something else. Uh, and uh, one, one last takeaway was uh, we think it's an exciting time uh, in terms of a lot of the technologies that are out there beyond immersive technology, such as artificial intelligence, which I referenced earlier, uh, neurotechnology, uh, you know, other things like maybe blockchain. Uh, and we think when thinking about immersive technology, we should also think about the interactions of these different uh, technologies with each other, so how immersive tech might apply with uh, AI. Uh, and uh, policy, we think, should be mindful of these interactions. And when people think of these issues, they should be uh, mindful of these interactions. So that sort of summarizes the main findings of the report and what's in it. Happy to answer uh, more questions about the report uh, as you would like uh, later in the uh, event. Yeah, yeah, thank you. This, this is a very exciting time to be uh, working on these sort of technologies and things as they're emerging. Uh, so Liz, I'll turn to you. You partnered with us on this uh, BPC initiative on XR, which involved bringing together stakeholders from various different industries and uh, government. What did you learn from this process? Well, first of all, I thought John did a great job of summarizing the report. Um, and you know, we're a relatively new group ourselves uh, in the sense that the, the technology is emerging, so, so is this group. And we wanted to reach out and work with BPC because we know we can't uh, just talk to ourselves. We need to convene these broad-based uh, groups of stakeholders um, so that we know, you know civil society and academia and government and industry are all at the table having uh, these kinds of conversations. And so that is invaluable um, as we as we start to move down this experience to where it is, in fact, the, the computing platform of the future. Um, I think what I learned is that 
while we may not have reached agreement around all of the issues that have been uh, put onto the table, I think we saw some really interesting ideas and proposals. And uh, the whole idea here is to start to surface some of these things as we as we start to identify what are those issues, you know, whether it's in privacy and, and thinking about, for example, making sure that the forward facing cameras, that there's a clear uh, signal that those are on, or maybe some blurring technology, whatever that might be. Um, I think we learned some really interesting things about, uh, for example, expression um, of your, uh, you know, it could be uh, something like your gender preference or whether you have a disability or whatever it may be, you can articulate this through an avatar, unlike uh, opportunities in the past. But we also have to be careful when we're thinking about such experiences to make sure that we're not revealing something that somebody doesn't want to have revealed. So there were a lot of different equities that um, came up throughout the conversation that I thought was really um, very, very constructive. And I guess that's it. You know, there's a lot of goodwill here uh, to try to get ahead of these conversations. This technology is emerging. It's being used more and more, but it is not widely adopted at the moment. And so we really do need to get ahead of the curve and make sure that like this report does, it surfaces some very serious issues that we need to address, but I think also really balanced nicely what the, what the incredible opportunities are as well. And so that's what we need to do as we go forward is to think about those opportunities, but be very clear eyed right now about how we go address and address the issues that, that everybody brought to the table. Okay. So I'll pose the same question to Jeremy and Jessica, but with a little bonus question on the end of what, was there anything that stood out to you? So what did you learn from this process and was there anything that stood out? And I'll start with you, Jessica. Yeah, um, I appreciated how in each of the convenings, there was this, um, this, this vision of like, how would policy form? Um, and so my background is, you know, typically I work with the product teams that are creating VR, AR, MR technologies um, and providing research and insights to inform those decisions. And um, the, the vision from the technology perspective is so strong. And where, um, where, I got to, where I got really excited and where I was happy to learn from BPC and all of the people that attended the convenings was how to have, like, uh, have that same sort of vision when it comes to policymaking to match the technological vision. Thank you. So Jeremy, same question. What did you learn throughout this process? And uh, anything stood out or surprised you? Sure. Yeah, I think it was it was great for me to see that there were there were other like minded folks kind of thinking about these things, worrying about data privacy and security. And, you know, as a public institution, you know, we're we're bound by federal law to protect student data. And so we think a lot about these types of technologies. What does it mean for data collection? What does it mean for student uh, privacy and security? And so it was just it was great to see folks from many different industries and policy working together to come up with, you know, recommendations and, and a path forward to help uh, inform potential legislation in the future. I think what what stood out to me. I mean, I I, I think I understood a little bit, but just how. Uh, new the technology is to other folks and how kind of unclear all the different use cases are. Um, you know, I live in this every day, so it's, it's pretty clear to me what all the use cases are, but how much more advocacy and uh, discussion and education we have to do with, with the wider audience. Okay, and Jeremy, I'd like to just stick with you for a second. Uh, sure. The report talks about the need to think about these immersive technologies in a more holistic uh, mm -hmm. way and Think about them in the context of other technologies like AI and neurotechnology. How does immersive technology relate to other technologies? And what does this mean for public policy? Yeah, I think there's a there's a huge convergence happening. I think a lot of these technologies like blockchain and Web3 and, and AI are you know converging quickly with, you know. What is, what is being called the metaverse and, and these immersive technologies and, and NFTs and how some of the content's being created. And so I think it's important uh, to think about them holistically in, in terms of what sort of policy 
how do they interact with each other? How does a, a policy for one of these technologies perhaps impact others? And you know, I think as as we're teaching students how to become creators in this space, as the, you're trying to influence the vendors working with the XRA uh, to have impact, I think it's important to you know raise awareness around how the technologies work together and, and you know what responsibility we have as creators uh, to set the stage for the future. Thank you. So I want to turn to Jessica now. Uh, you do research on uh, privacy and the BBC report on XR touches on privacy. Can you tell us about your research uh, and anything you learn through these convenings um, about some of the privacy concerns in XR? And what are some of your privacy concerns that you think about in the context of XR? Sure. Yeah, so um, last year I ran a thousand person survey of people in the United States to gather what are their attitudes and preferences when it comes to data collection. And I asked specifically about types of devices that they might own right now, such as mobile phones or, um, or smart speakers or, um, or like the contemporary technology. And then I also asked about some future facing use cases. And there's a, there's a pretty high level of distress that people reported around how they feel like their data is being managed. Um, there are examples where, you know, they might agree to the terms and conditions, but then, you know, if they, if they receive ads afterwards, um, they, that feels like a violation. So there's, there's, there's people's feelings about their privacy um, that are in a relatively high, high level of distress right now, to the point where almost a third of people in the survey listed one or more uh, privacy, one or more um, product or service that they won't use because of privacy concerns. So I think that gives us a sense of where people are at right now. Um, and then, um, another, another thing to come out of that research is there were a lot of insights on, all right, well, this is how people are feeling. What does that actually mean when it comes to decision making? And so I've taken that report um, and then used that as the basis to come up with what I'm calling seven metaverse privacy principles uh, to really like help guide teams that are that want to be like be more focused on that user centered design and how do you center on underrepresented groups and focus on equity how do you um, how do you make sure that the content is not going to be um, that that people are not people are going to like have a have an understanding of how the technology works and then another aspect is how do you like really consider what are the power dynamics at play when people are using a product? Because you know the people that are um, creating the technology have such a better sense of what what data is collected and how the data is used. How do you how do you better empower people to understand that when um, when you know you're the one that's um, you're the one that's, you know, that like right now it's the, it's the companies that write, write the terms and conditions that have the power in that dynamic. And so I think that's something else that, um, could really be considered going forward. Thank you. Thank you. As a person who's never read the terms and conditions, um, that is something that I do need to think about more. Um, so I want to turn to you, John, uh, how does the XR work fit in the context of other BPC work or other work that we've been doing and any lessons you took from previous work and were able to apply it to the XR work and vice versa, anything you learned during this process that you could take back to your other work at BPC. Yeah, uh, definitely. So uh, BPC has been doing a lot of work on uh, issues, not just immersive tech, but uh, AI. We've been doing work on competition policy in the context of the uh, what I call the big tech debate. Uh, we've uh, looked at blockchain hosted an event a couple of weeks ago, uh, sort of on uh, that topic. And one thing I find is how interrelated uh, a lot of issues are with each other. Uh, so for instance, when we were doing our uh, one of our convenings where economic issues was a focus on immersive tech, competition policy came up. 
a question came up saying, um, well, how can we ensure, you know, the market for virtual reality is going to be competitive in the future? What, 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 what's the role of antitrust? Do we have the right policies? Do we make tweaks? So there's a lot of uh, interconnections between, you know, the policies of immersive effect that we're working on now and some of the other topics we're working on. Uh, additionally, a lot of times we uh, run into the same problem, just slightly differently, uh, maybe uh, approach. So with our AI work, we uh, had to uh, look at uh, privacy issues in the context of artificial intelligence with immersive technology, uh, similar question. How do we, you know, sort of uh, protect privacy uh, in the context of virtual reality? So a lot of uh, overlaps and uh, you know, connections between between the different different topics. Uh, finally, uh, BPC takes this sort of a bipartisan approach, and sometimes we need more than just bipartisan in the sense of uh, Republicans and Democrats. Uh, we are looking for a multi-stakeholder approach where we engage different elements of civil society, industry, academia, uh, to sort of get you know different people's perspectives uh, together and try to sort of and see what, what do people really think? Like when you have a candid conversation, what, what are the issues as they see them? Uh, what are some solutions that you know people like and might actually agree on? Uh, what are areas of disagreement? Because learning that is very important. Uh, you know, when people disagree on something, it's good to at least know like it is discreet for this reason. Maybe we need to focus on these other areas. Maybe that's not a bridgeable gap. Uh, maybe we you know focus on something else. Uh, so with BPC's work, yeah, we think stakeholder engagement is very important. And, you know, the more technologies we've sort of looked into, the more important we thought a bipartisan approach, a multi-stakeholder approach uh, is to getting ahead of a lot of the issues that people either have concerns about now or uh, might likely have uh, concerns about whether it's uh, how to sort of leverage the benefits or minimize the harms. Okay, so I want to turn to you, Liz. Uh, now that this initiative is over, uh, what's next for the XRA? Um, or in other words, uh, what is the industry's next step? Yeah, great question. So I think the best way to answer that is to sort of start with this statement, which is we have to continue the work that we've already started as a industry association representing uh, all these creative, innovative companies uh, that, that are in the XR space. We want to make sure that we continue to build on the shoulders of things that we've done, such as our best practices guides. Um, you know, it's interesting. We we absolutely have to keep educating policymakers and other stakeholders um, about what you know what the technology does and what some of the issues are. But that doesn't take away our responsibility to act as well. And so these best practices guides, we've already done um, three chapters of them, whether it was looking at sort of safety and ergonomics of the devices themselves or creating respectful, uh, you know, safe, immersive spaces or making XR accessible um, to people of all abilities. Um, these are things that we've already started to work on. And this year, we're also turning our gaze towards the use of XR by teenagers in an educational context. And so we will soon be doing a workshop with Joan Gans CUNY Center, which is uh, the Sesame Street organization that looks at the impact of technology on young people. Um, and we're going to take some of the learnings that we get from such an effort and do yet another chapter of best practices. So we have an obligation to keep doing this, to, to sort of set the best bar possible for how we use these types of technologies. Um, but we also uh, have taken note and uh, understand the importance of a multi-stakeholder effort. And in February, we launched our Future of XR Advisory Council. And uh, in that, we've uh, similarly um, assembled a, a broad array of folks, whether they're in industry or civil society, um, academia, even government uh, participants as well. And we're really trying to, as a group, look at and develop a shared vision and way of articulating uh, what we're doing with XR um, so that there's clarity and understanding about what a metaverse is, what immersive technologies are, you know, how we think about these things. And to also sort of set expectations. Um, so the excitement about the metaverse has been fantastic. And I think it's really starting to get people to pay attention to the technology. And that's really important. 
but it also kind of creates this maybe a misimpression that we're there you know that we already have these fully formed metaverses and the technology is such that we can all take full advantage of it we're still an emerging technology and i think we need to figure out what that set of expectations looks like and communicate that clearly to the public and then finally um how do we take some of the work that has been done here at BPC or IEEE or um, some of the work that Jessica has done, how do we take that and create more detailed work plans on uh, what are the principles and recommendations for policymakers? Because at the end of the day, that is one of our principal roles. You know, we, we are all about uh, research and best practices, but we are also all about making sure that lawmakers and other stakeholders really have the information they need to make smart decisions as well. So that's uh, some of what we're engaged in, uh, a lot more, but I'll leave it at that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Sounds like you, have, you are, are being very forward looking and sounds uh, like you have a lot coming down the pike for you guys. It'd be very interesting. Uh, I'll we'll pose this question. <laughs> So I'll pose this question to, to all of the panelists. Uh, how well informed do you think that policymakers and other stakeholders are um, on immersive technology? And what do you think can be done to further educate the policymakers and stakeholders? And Jessica, I'll let you get the uh, first shot at it. Ooh, well, um, knowing knowing what's inside the minds of policyholders at the policymakers is not is not exactly my area of expertise but what i can can do is um is i can share what californians knowledge of the ccpa protections are so maybe i can i can come from a bottom-up perspective on on this question because in the survey last year i showed about 300 people in california to like the list of the ccpa protections and i asked to what extent they thought that they were eligible for these protections. And it was only a very small percentage that claimed um, that claimed three or more, but really like they're eligible for five right now. And they will be um, they'll be eligible for a sixth starting next year as it relates to opting out. And so I would just really encourage people to, to think about, you know, when it comes to policymaking and like ideas and, and like policies such as the CCPA that gives the consumers like, you know, individual empowerment, um, you know, how are consumers going to be educated to know to take advantage of the rights that they have. And really quickly before we move on, what is the CCPA? Uh, the California Consumer Privacy Act. Thank you. Thank you. So same question to you, Jeremy. Um, how well informed do you think policymakers and stakeholders are and what can be done to better educate them? Yeah, I, I don't know how well informed they are you know, in terms of the policy that affects us as an educational institution the most around FERPA. And, you know, we have a hospital here, so HIPAA, as well as the Civil Rights Act and the Disabilities Act, you know, we're working with uh, folks from other universities like Georgia Tech and the New School to to create some uh, white papers to, to educate folks on what this means uh, from an educational standpoint, what sort of policies internally at the institution. So we're trying to educate both internally uh, plus externally. So I think some of it just raising awareness, kind of uh, educating folks on what types of information these devices and these experiences can collect, and then providing some recommendations on how best uh, to to amend these policies that affect us uh, more broadly, and participating in, in with groups like XRA and this uh, BPC. It's been really helpful. Okay, so I'm turn the same question to you, Leas. Um, yeah. What's your gauge on policymakers, and stakeholders? Um, well, first of all, I just want to point out it's wonderful to see people like Chike Agu, who really do have a good knowledge of the technology, not only how it works, but also the potential uh, in this instance for upskilling workers and, and establishing and working towards equity in terms of how we roll out and scale up the technology. So it's always exciting to see 
uh, you know, folks that are in government that do understand this. Um, I'd also give a shout out to uh, something called the Reality Caucus, um, which is a sort of a special interest group on Capitol Hill in the House of Representatives. It's uh, members of Congress that have a shared interest around the technology. And they've been working with us and other groups to you know, bring in experts and sort of educate themselves about how the technology is working, but also to think about what, you know, what legislative vehicles uh, might be helpful. Um, so we're, we're really pleased we've done, uh, for example, we did a really interesting session with them uh, around COVID and how the technology was helping uh, individuals, doctors, and others um, to understand the disease, to, to see it in a three-dimensional way. Um, so those are just a, a couple of examples. Um, but I will say, you know, if you go up to the average uh, Hill staffer and you say, hey, what do you know about virtual reality? They'll go, oh, it's gaming. Um, and so I do think it's incumbent upon all of us to, to really get out there and sort of share, you know, the potential and the way in which this can be used um, across different sectors of the economy. Um, I think that's vital. Uh, we're going to continue to to work on those those efforts um, and and sort of get that level of uh, enthusiasm and understanding growing as we go along. And I think this report today goes a long way uh, to help uh, create a vivid example of how you can use the technology and what some of the conversations are around it. So I think great job, BPC. Okay. Lastly, John. Yeah, uh, so yeah, I think uh, policymakers, again, just starting to grapple with these issues. What I've seen often uh, is people coming to immersive tech from a different angle, uh, meaning like someone's interested in workforce training, uh, then they see sort of a program or a you know, company that's adopted, say, a VR headset to train you know, their workers when it comes to like retail works. I see a lot of people coming from it from that angle or someone studying privacy issues. They learn about sort of a VR headsets and eye tracking and sort of the privacy concerns that that raises and thinking about in the context of a broader uh, privacy debate. So I see a lot of people uh, sort of, you know, coming at this from different angles, uh, maybe fewer people who are focused on just immersive tech for the, you know, um, immersive tech part of it, if, if that makes sense. Uh, we, we suggest, and again, we're just going to plug the report again. Uh, we suggest people uh, look at our report, look at some of the blogs we've written, summarizing some of what was said in the convenings uh, as a place to start when learning about uh, issues pertaining to immersive tech, again, whether it's uh, safety, whether it's security, whether it's equity and inclusion. Uh, our effort was not at all meant to be the final word. It's mostly meant to be a conversation starter, get people to start thinking about the different uh, issues immersive tech uh, brings about and maybe help them when they're thinking about the other issues they're uh, focused on. Again, whether it's workforce training, privacy, security, you name it. Uh, so yeah, we we think again, it's early days. And, and that said, uh, we do want to encourage people who are engaged uh, on immersive tech issues, whether it's part of our process or uh, part of a broader stakeholder community. Uh, you know, please, uh, you know, talk about these issues. If you're in a event about, again, privacy, bring up how maybe eye tracking uh, or bystander privacy, someone wearing AR glasses, maybe recording someone else, how, how that relates to the broader uh, privacy conversation. Because we think to have meaningful input uh, for policymakers, uh, more informed uh, stakeholders and a uh, public can help. Because we think good policy uh, should, uh, you know, come flow from a diversity of viewpoints. And it's uh, great when the uh, diversity of viewpoints we can get uh, already know a lot about the issue. So again, please spread the word. And uh, yeah, ch ch check out our report. Uh, we we're trying to start a conversation. And, and great points. I just want to take a second for the viewers watching to say you can submit questions uh, to the panel on hashtag BBC Live on Twitter or in the chat if you're watching on YouTube. So moving right along to the next question, what is an XR use case that you would like to highlight for the audience? And can you talk through any policy questions that this use case uh, raises? And I'll stick with you, John, for that. 
Yes, yeah, so I've always been fascinated with the uh, healthcare applications. Uh, so again, through our process, we learned about uh, sort of like how medical schools are using uh, VR to train surgeons. Uh, and in fact, one of the policy issues I heard is uh, when you're using a VR headset to train the surgeon, uh, should that information be recorded? If yes, should it uh, be potentially used in, you know, the questions that arose were, uh, would that be used in say a lawsuit if let's say the surgeon, you know, gets involved in a malpractice uh, issue? Uh, there's also questions of, well, how, how do we best leverage a VR tool or is it the appropriate tool in different contexts when it comes to training someone in healthcare? Uh, existing uh, privacy protections in the context of healthcare. So uh, HIPAA, that's the main privacy law in the healthcare space. Uh, should it be changed? Does it need to be modified? Is it appropriate? Do we need a new law? These are questions that sort of uh, have uh, come up. Another application in healthcare, which I thought was interesting, was a lot of people talk about uh, XR for exposure therapy. Uh, so one thing that we saw is uh, people with fear of heights uh, might be able to expose themselves to a you know, situation where maybe they're on top of a very tall building uh, to sort of get exposed to what uh, they're afraid of under the context of, you know, just your, your uh, therapy session. And I thought that was another uh, cool area. And again, privacy questions often are security questions because the data you have, you, you want to be secure, uh, those come up. And we just need to keep, keep asking questions and thinking about them and, again, reviewing policy to see, see what needs to be done, policy and standards. Okay, so Jeremy, um, I'm actually interested to, to hear this. Um, sure. Yeah, so, well, I mean, fear of heights, I personally suffer from that. So that I've tried some of these games to, to solve it for myself and uh, probably need a little more professional help to work through that. Uh, but from, from our perspective, the one I'm most excited about is uh, we worked with our nursing school here at the University of Michigan where they were trying to, you know, they were growing, you know, the, the program 30 to 40 percent year over year. They didn't have enough faculty to teach all the students. You know, there's a huge nursing shortage in the United States. And so they were trying to see are there ways that we could use these technologies to scale up training. In particular, we have a large simulation center. Uh, students learn procedures with mannequins and so we worked with them to design a training where they wore a hololens so a head worn uh, mixed reality or augmented reality device where they could work with the mannequin uh, to have basically they can look at a qr code next to the mannequin and it pops up in their display and a step-by-step -step instructions do you want to learn lumbar puncture do you want to learn catheterization do you want to learn uh, chest tube insertion and so they've been able to run some studies where you know, they were the students were able to be more self-directed. Uh, they could reduce faculty time, increase uh, student confidence because they weren't being watched all the time, so they could make the mistakes uh, kind of on their own. And then we've had interest in collaborations with folks in England and the NHS, and they're looking at these same types of technologies and how do they upskill uh, their healthcare workforce. And so I think you know there's just some really interesting opportunities there. And then from a policy perspective, like what does this mean uh, for, for how do we train people in the future? And, and will it pass all the standards uh, that are required for the healthcare space, in particular nursing? Okay, thank you. I'll turn to you, Jessica, uh, for a use case that you would like to highlight for the audience. Yeah, yeah, I would, I would just go back to um, what Chike said at the beginning about how people will be able to access, you know, new types of jobs using, using these types of devices. And I think when it comes to, you know, what are the potential policy implications of, you know, having knowledge workers using VR and AR devices. Um, I'm curious if there will be any limits on the types of surveillance that employers could do of, of their employees because currently like the data streams that are collected include a lot of location data, include health and wellness data. It has implications for mental privacy. Um, I mean, it's, 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 a little bit, uh, it's a little bit out there, but you know, there's the potential that employers could track where you're, paying, where you're looking inside of meetings and are you paying attention to the speaker and um, other other things such as they could they could try to use the data to predict whether or not you have a disability or not, um, and they could be right or they could be wrong, but they 
but you know, as of right now, I'm not aware of any limitations on how employers can track their employees if they're giving their employees devices. So that's an area where I think, you know, again, to bring up the power dynamics between employers and employees, I think that's an area that I'm going to be watching as the field evolves. Okay, exciting and a bit scary uh, when you really dig in and think about it, uh, but the exciting kind. Uh, so Liz, I want to turn to you. Same yeah. question. Um, so I think all of these have been fantastic examples. Um, and I too is going to kind of point back to something that Chike talked about. And we actually partnered with the Partnership for Employment and Accessible Technology, which is a program through the Department of Labor that's focused on accessibility and, and workforce opportunities. Um, and we highlighted in this paper a few jobs. Um, for example, a wind turbine technician, um, that because of augmented and mixed reality, you can now have a real-time assistance in the field um, to do the job. Um, you know, whether, whether it's uh, fixing the turbine or um, it could be something else. Uh, and for someone, for example, who's neurodiverse and may have challenges in terms of um, reading in, in, and translating some of the instructions that have been there in the past, to have a real-time assist opportunity with somebody who is working with you or for that person who may be disabled themselves, um, but are providing their expertise through being the real-time assist. So what we wanted to do was try to take some real-world examples and some of the fastest jobs out there, growing jobs, um, and explain the connection between um, XR and uh, job skills and empowering people who may have disabilities to do these jobs in a way that they haven't been able to do before. Um, I agree. I think Jessica has raised some really great questions in terms of what the employer-employee dynamic is, but these are, I think this helps to illustrate sort of the complexity of the conversation. We may be empowering people to do things that they haven't been able to do because of this technology, and we just have to get the balance right in terms of those power dynamics. There's no question, but the excitement of being able to put this to use, I think, is, is really, really um, uh, encouraging and exciting to me. Um, and I would encourage folks to check out the Pete white paper. It's on their website. So. Thank you. Thank you. Very, very cool stuff. Um, so Jeremy, I want to turn to you. Just, we're going to turn to the speculative portion, sure. uh, the sort of futurist portion. Uh, yeah. Five years from now, what will be the state of XR? Yeah, I mean, I think I think we're going to continue to see, you know, proliferation of devices. I think they're going to get smaller. I think they're going to get closer to to something like this. Hopefully, you know, there's still some some physics to figure out around heat and, and battery and and things like that. You know, I think you'll see uh, definitely deeper into the workforce, like these technologies and tools being used. You know, from an educational standpoint, I think we're really excited about what we're calling our blended future. And so we, we have remote learners, we have online learners, we have on-campus learners. And so you know, bringing all those folks together uh, kind of in, into shared spaces, uh, you know, taking people on, on you know, virtual field trips or kind of to places, uh, other parts of the universe that maybe they can't go. So I think we'll, just, we'll see more use cases. It'll become less friction. Uh, and there's still quite a bit of friction to get into some of these experiences, especially at scale. You know, when we're talking, you know, hundreds of people simultaneously and managing it from, a, you know, an institutional perspective around all the, the privacy we have with devices and things. So you know, I think you'll you'll see kind of these mixed mixed reality courses and you have remote people and uh, residential you know, on campus folks living together and or working together on projects and in classes. Thanks. Thanks. Sounds really, really cool. And. Uh, I can't wait for five years from now. <laughs> um, so I want to turn this to everyone and open it up the questioning. Uh, is there any topic that you want to talk about from the report that we haven't gotten to uh, or gotten a chance to comment on today? Um, is, anyone wants to chime in, Liz? Sure. I think it was mentioned, but I will just reinforce it. Um, this issue of equity uh, and making sure 
that people can connect to and use the technology. Um, we're, we're working as part of a, something called Opportunity Broadband. We need to make sure that broadband exists um, to, to those that have not had it before. Uh, it doesn't just impact our technology, it impacts uh, all kinds of um, technological tools that are available to people. And, and so that's something I feel very strongly about, um, but there are other ways to ensure um, access. I recently heard this amazing uh, example of the Nevada public library system making available headsets to remote districts in Nevada so that they could use it to train for a certification in a particular, uh, in this instance, it was a healthcare related certification. Um, these are the types of creative approaches that we need to think about and make sure people have access to the technology. Okay, John, uh, anything from the report that we haven't gotten to today? Yeah, the only thing I just want to sort of uh, reference is, uh, I think it's important to sort of review uh, the policies that are there, the standards that are there to again, figure out what's worked, what hasn't worked, what gaps exist. I don't think this is a easy uh, effort. Again, we, we try to do this, you know, in a one year period with a, you know, uh, relatively small group of people, uh, but, you know, to really dig into uh, what immersive technologies mean and how they relate to the issues we talked about, access, equity, uh, inclusion, you know, some things we didn't get to in the report. Uh, it's, it's a major task. And a second thing I want to highlight is uh, I think it's important to have, uh, you know, more conversations about this, uh, try to inform a broader set of stakeholders and the public uh, media, because uh, we think it's very important. If, if you do want to get a diversity of uh, viewpoints and backgrounds to give input, it's, it's very necessary to help inform them and help them make their own this or give them the information they need to make make their own uh, decision and uh, sort of you know help chart the course of uh, immersive tech and public policy. Uh, so again, I, I just want to reiterate. Yeah, I think uh, making the process uh, inclusive to get a diversity of voices voices is very important, uh, and so is uh, various experts and stakeholders trying to help. Uh, inform people so they can make their own uh, make their own minds and help guide policymakers more long term. Okay, uh, Jessica or Jeremy, uh, anything to add that we didn't touch yeah. on? Yeah, I can I can speak to this. There's um there's a way in which I think the the report really lays a foundation around the issues around VR and AR and. Um, and XR, and I think it's really helpful. And I think where I, where, you know, there's also a little bit about, you know, what people are calling the metaverse and like how it relates to blockchain. And, um, and so I think like where this is probably, where, where I see this evolving over time is going to be, you know, a more integrative approach to artificial intelligence, you know, uh, neurotechnologies, um, everything related to crypto and, and Web3, like all of the use cases that those present inside of the metaverse. And so I was, I'm glad to see that this report is out, that it lays such a strong foundation. And, and you know, I really, I really hope that it invites people to start looking really critically around what are the needs, um, because, you know, all of these technologies are evolving together and are going to become, you know, even more intertwined over the coming years. And so hopefully this report can help inform, uh, you know, what, what is the eventual policy that is going to um, be in effect for this tech. Thank you. And Jeremy, did you have anything you want to highlight? Yeah, I'd just like to, to reinforce, uh, you know, the area of data privacy and, and data transparency. And just as, as creators, as people building these experiences and, and building the data, or the applications just because you can collect the data doesn't mean that you should so just being thoughtful and mindful as we go forward both from you know uh, a developer standpoint the companies the policies so i think you know taking on that responsibility as as folks are creating these experiences okay well thank you thank you on that uh i want to get to at least one of the questions that were uh, sent in online so we have a question from Karim uh, Muhammad Ali. What pitfalls should industry avoid 
when it comes to building the XR ecosystem and specifically policy advocacy. And I'll turn to you first, John. Yeah, one thing which uh, I think should uh, be you know, sort of mentioned, and actually I should have brought this up earlier, uh, immersive technologies don't just affect the people who use them directly. Uh, they often affect people who don't use them. So again, with augmented reality glasses, uh, if it's recording a bystander, it's not just the person who's using the glasses uh, that's being affected by it. It's also the people who indirectly are you know, being reported. Uh, and this, I think, is a very important thing for industry to keep in mind. Uh, that, uh, and same goes with other stakeholders who are trying to advocate on behalf of civil society. Uh, it's not just about the people who develop or use the technology, it's also about the people who are affected uh, by the technology uh, more broadly. So we need to make sure uh, to hear from uh, you know, a variety of people, including those who aren't gonna be using the technology directly, by, uh, but affected by it. I think that's critical. Okay, and I'd like to, get your voice on this list since you're uniquely positioned on this uh, pitfalls that the industry should avoid um, yeah. and build an ecosystem well i think i sort of tread trotted tread on this subject at the beginning of the of the session which is um we have an opportunity to get ahead of the the process if you will um as i said this is a emerging technology it is growing there's no question but we're not at a tipping point here where every every household has a headset. Um, and so, uh, you know, John raised a really interesting question around bystander privacy. And this question actually has arisen in the context of the smartphone, right? Uh, and the ability to take and capture images wherever you are. It's just that now this is multiplied, right? Um, because it's more of a, a streaming opportunity when you're when you're for example, if somebody with low vision is walking down a street and the camera actually helps them to identify things that they couldn't see before, we have bystander privacy at issue. Um, so, you know, the important thing here is um, to recognize and use our time wisely um, and not, you know, build and then answer. We need to answer as we go along. So there's no question about that. Okay. Um, Jeremy, any thoughts on industry, uh, what they should be doing and how they should be thinking about building the ecosystem? Yeah, I would just echo everything that's been said, but I would think from a, at least when you're creating trainings or, or educational content, just making sure that your learning goals and objectives are clearly identified and stated. You know, there's some really cool things we can do with this technology, but just because we can, is it the right tool? Is it the right uh, medium for that? And so just making sure that's all clear as you're building out your strategy and your plan. Okay, and Jessica? Yeah, I'm, I'm really interested in working with companies who want to rethink like how to collect data, what are the privacy settings, what are the systems and the standards around like how data is used. Um, I think when it comes to like what the pitfalls are, I think, you know, when I look at the landscape of technology right now, I think there's just this assumption that people will manage their own privacy and that people are, are capable of managing their own privacy. And I think that um, that like putting it onto the individuals uh, rather than designing defaults that are going to protect people. Um, I think that's that's really what I'm looking at when it comes to um, what are what are the beliefs uh, that are driving the creation of these systems and, and these technologies right now. Okay. Thank you. Um, so one last question from the audience. This question is from Leon Stinnett. What must uh, Congress and the White House and others do to avoid the weaponization of reality technology? And, and so I'll start with you, uh, Liz, if you want to tell yeah. me. That's a, I mean, it's a great last question. Um, I think that, uh, you know, what's really at issue here is, um, you know, sometimes in our in our world in the United States, it's a messy process. And there's this tension between, um, you know, industry and government and civil society. Uh, and that's why this particular effort was so important is to bring all those stakeholders together 
And I say that because what's important is making sure that this technology grows with a lot of the values that we hold dear in our society. And if you look at what could happen, say, for example, in China, where some of those values are not shared, it means that they're going to continue to progress and grow this technology no matter what we do. So we need to get together here uh, in, in the Western society and make sure that we're doing the right thing by this technology um, so that it is the counter, the, the counterbalance to countries that may not well hold our values dear. So that's a very broad statement, but we're towards the end of our, our session. So great question. All right, so I would just like the time to uh thank Chike for coming out uh, and giving us the keynote for today. I'd like to thank the viewers for tuning in. Thank you to the panel. Uh, you all have been great. Uh, and lastly, I would like to thank the team, uh, our events team and everyone who helped to make this a success. Mary Margaret, Cal, Greg, Danielle, and the rest of the tech policy team at BPC. And thank you to BPC and the XRA for bringing this together. Um, and Appreciate having you all here, and it's been a great discussion. Yeah. Thanks, Thank Babu. Thank you. Thank you.